Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor and uh, privilege for me uh, to lead this uh, discussion. Uh, today, we have a symposia entitled by Assessment for Better Quality of Education, Success Story and Challenges. Terima kasih, Pak Ananta. Thank you, Mr. Ananta. Um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to share with you some of our uh, ways of using uh, large-scale assessment data in Indonesia within the context of Perdeka Belajar. Um, I shall try to keep it under 15 minutes, so please, next slide. Just a few months before the pandemic hit, uh, around the end of 2019, in Indonesia we launched a comprehensive initiative to transform our education system. We call this Merdeka Belajar or Emancipated Learning. Um, our goal ultimately is to ensure that all students, regardless of where they happen to live in Indonesia, regardless of their social, economic, or cultural backgrounds, can have the opportunity to develop foundational competencies um, through education. Now, of course, this goal is not unique. Uh, indeed, it is well aligned with goal number four in the SDGs, to ensure quality and equity in education. What we believe is unique is the speed and the scale of our reform, uh, reform efforts in Indonesia. In a span of two and a half years, we have designed and started to implement 22 priority programs which touch all of the key elements in our education system, from teacher training to student scholarship, uh, school funding mechanisms to, of course, curriculum and assessment. In the next slide, um, uh, we are well aware that implementing such a wide-ranging reform can be overwhelming. There's always a risk of confusing stakeholders with too many programs and initiatives and can be seen as separate and sometimes conflicting with each other. Mindful of this, we try to make sure that our policies are well aligned. We drew an analogy from the well-established principle of alignment at the course design level, for example, proposed by John Biggs and Wiggins and McTighe. In, in this approach, course design begins with being clear about the goal, the learning outcomes, what we want students to learn, what we want students to know and be able to do. And then based on this description of learning outcomes, course designers should specify the evidence needed to be able to demonstrate the extent to which learning outcomes are met by students. This is the assessment component uh, in course design. And then course designers can start to plan the activities which provide students the opportunity to develop the knowledge and skills and to demonstrate these knowledge and skills. So this approach uh, should enhance the probability that students experience uh, can be aligned with the learning objectives and how they are assessed. Next slide, please. At the policy level, objectives are often formulated as standards. In our Merdeka Belajar reform, we have written several new standards uh, regarding student graduate profile, principles of teaching and learning, and curriculum content. We are in the process of rewriting as well standards on teacher and principal competencies as well as standards on school management. These standards then become the basis of evaluating the performance of schools and districts. And then uh, we design more operational guidance and materials uh, to train teachers and principals to be able uh, to plan their teaching and manage schools and for districts uh, to analyze evidence of learning quality and to plan accordingly. Next. I will focus my presentation today on how we measure performance uh, of our system. This is where the new national assessment comes in. The national assessment is a large-scale assessment first conducted in 2021, when we collected data from more than 6 million students and 3 million teachers 
in almost 260,000 schools across Indonesia. Applying the alignment principle, we use the national assessment to gather evidence on whether and to the extent to which uh, standards have been met at the school level and at the district level. And then to use this information to shape the behavior of teachers, principals, and district officials. Next. One way the national assessment can shape behavior is by communicating what teachers, principals, schools, and districts should prioritize in education. This is reflected in what is measured, what we measure in the national assessment. Uh, in this case, the national assessment measures key learning outcomes of literacy, numeracy, and a number of socio-emotional dispositions we call character. We also measure what students experience in the classroom and at their school. These include uh, teaching quality, uh, for example, how well teachers manage their classrooms uh, so that uh, disruptions are minimized and students can focus their attention on learning activities, uh, the quality of emotional support that teachers provide to their students, uh, the extent to which uh, teachers have a growth mindset about their students. So this is uh, whether teachers believe that their students have the ability to grow and develop their ability continuously, uh, and to the extent to which teachers can structure a lesson, provide clear instruction, and engage students to think deeply about the curriculum materials. Uh, we also measure students' experiences in terms of safety climate and the so social climate or inclusiveness climate in the school. So safety climate, um, we measure uh, bullying, for example, sexual violence, drug use, and corporal punishment. Uh, we use data from incidences of bullying and um, sexual violence, drug use, uh, from the student's perspective, as well as teachers' efficacy and knowledge about these issues. Similarly, uh, to measure inclusiveness climate, uh, we ask students about their experiences, and then we ask teachers about their knowledge, their conceptions, and uh, their efficacy in handling issues of tolerance and inclusive attitude, gender equity, accommodation of uh, students with special needs. And then we also measure the behavior of teachers and principals. Um, these include um, teacher reflection and learning, so critical reflection of teachers, their motivation to seek new, new knowledge, and their willingness to take risks and innovate. We also, we also measure principals' instructional leadership, um, whether principals uh, formulate a school vision that is learning-oriented, uh, how well they manage the, the curriculum, and whether they provide concrete support for teachers to reflect and to learn continuously. We also measure the participatory management uh, climate of each school, whether students and parents uh, are involved in the teaching and learning planning within a school. Next. To increase the utility of the national assessment, we created a digital education scorecard platform where schools and districts can access the results of their national assessment combined with administrative data. This is meant to be a formative tool, mainly, a mirror to prompt reflection and data-driven planning uh, by the principals and district officials. Using this platform, each school can easily see how well they perform against national standards and against, uh, in comparison to other schools that are similar to them at the regional and at the national levels. Uh, in terms of student literacy, teaching quality, uh, teacher learning, and so on. And using the same platform, districts can easily identify schools in their region which underperform or in need of special attention uh, in terms of bullying. So uh, with one click, districts can identify schools that experience a lot of bullying and uh, in need of intervention, or schools that uh, are underperforming in terms of literacy or numeracy. And conversely, uh, districts can also easily identify schools that, are, that, have, uh, that show high performance 
and can be a resource for knowledge sharing to other schools. Next. We also use the scorecard in other ways, in addition to providing assessment uh, data formatively. So, for example, we plan to provide incentives for schools and districts who make the most progress from year to year, starting from next year. And uh, we also uh, would like to incentivize districts who manage to close the gaps between the best and the worst performing schools in their region. At the national level, uh, we obviously use the data in the platform to monitor progress uh, and to identify pockets of excellence as well as problems which need special attention. Next. Um, so this is how we map disparities at the national level. Um, this is an illustration of how the data is used. Uh, we can map disparities between regions and Indonesia. We can quantify disparities in various criteria from student learning outcomes, literacy, numeracy, uh, to teaching quality and uh, school climate. Uh, this is a heat map showing the disparity of grade 5 student literacy across Indonesia. So as you can see, there's quite a big variety um, of uh, large disparities between regions in Indonesia. Um, in a way, this is not surprising. We've long known that these disparities exist, but now we can precisely quantify and identify regions uh, with specific issues. Next. We can also facilitate districts to do the same mapping, uh, to map disparities within each of their regions. This is very important as well because although in general the disparity between regions is larger than disparities within each of the regions, some regions do exhibit large uh, disparities. Uh, this graph shows uh, 10 of the most um, the biggest disparities uh, in, at the district level and 10 of the least, um, uh, the, the lowest disparities. As a comparison, the IQR at the national level is around 13 points and hence uh, these 10 districts exhibit disparities that are quite larger than the national average. Uh, and the standard deviation in reading literacy uh, nationally is about 16 points. So these are very, very large gaps. Um, the regions which exhibit low disparities, unfortunately, tend to be regions with low overall performance. Next. We can also use the data to identify regions uh, which manage to achieve both quality and equity. So while in general there is a positive correlation between quality and equity, so regions who exhibit high overall performance in literacy, for example, tend to be also regions that exhibit high disparity in terms of literacy. But there are exceptions, as always. And here uh, you can see that a number of regions uh, achieve both relatively high reading literacy while keeping the gap quite narrow. And uh, these are regions which uh, we are keen to learn from, uh, because they may offer insights on how to improve overall performance while keep uh, simultaneously closing the gaps between high and low performing schools. Next. We can also identify regions with um, relatively high quality um, on a low budget, so to speak. So this scatter plot shows that money matters. This is the amount of uh, local government revenue, pendapatan asli daerah, per student, uh, plotted against reading literacy, the average reading literacy within each district. We have 514 districts, by the way. And uh, as you can see, money matters for student learning to some extent, but that is especially the case in poor regions. So regions with PAD, uh, local government revenue, around uh, below 20 five million rupiah per student per, per year. Uh, but for more wealthy regions, the relationship between local revenue and student literacy is much, much weaker. Uh, so there, it seems that how we use the money matters much more compared to how much money uh, a district has. And by identifying these regions that punch above their weight, uh, so to speak, 
uh, we can learn again about how to best use um, uh, you know, budgetary constraints uh, to achieve uh, high performance in education. Next. Uh, we can also use the data to identify um, schools that are resilient, and this is what Pak Irshad will uh, share in the next uh, symposium. Um, we define resilient schools as uh, those schools who are at the bottom 20% in terms of socioeconomic status. So these are schools serving poor students and usually located in remote areas or areas that are uh, difficult to reach. Um, and whose students, at least 50% of those students, achieve a minimum standards in literacy and numeracy. So uh, these are schools that beat the odds. Right? Uh, among almost 50,000 schools uh, serving low SES students in difficult to access areas, we, we identified 4.2% 2,000 schools that are resilient. Next. And we can also not only identify uh, which schools they are, but we can also use the data to interrogate and characterize those schools. For example, here uh, we did a logistic regression um, uh, to uh, calculate the odds ratio um, that determines, uh, that is associated with uh, the probability of a school uh, being resilient. Right? And the analysis shows the importance of especially teaching quality, classroom management, emotional support, and cognitive activation, as well as school climate and safety um, climate, inclusiveness and safety climate. So uh, here we categorize each school uh, in terms of the quality of teaching and so on. And for each of these qualities, we categorize them into three levels. Level one, level two, and level three. Um, as you can see, uh, the result is quite stunning. So impoverished schools with good teaching quality at level three are 40 times more likely to be resilient compared to those with poor teaching quality. Impoverished schools which, are, uh, which have uh, a good safety climate are 20 th 25 times more likely uh, to be resilient. And schools with inclusive climates are around the same, 25 times more likely to be resilient. Next. Now, we are struggling with several um, dilemmas in terms of how to use the assessment results. Um, we had a very productive discussion with Andreas yesterday um, with the Minister of Education on uh, some of these issues. Uh, and An Andreas mentioned that it's one of the most decisive decisions that we can make um, uh, about how we use large-scale assessments like this uh, to drive learning and teaching and uh, policy making at the regional level. So, in terms of the level of detail, for example, there's a dilemma between providing a lot of detail or focusing on several aspects only. Providing a lot of detail can be more useful for planning, but it can be over overwhelming as well and may dilute the message that we want to come across. But only providing a small number of indicators, well, it's easier to communicate, but it might not be rich enough for planning purposes. Uh, then in terms of the kinds of uh, incentives we attach to these results. Yes, uh, putting incentives would encourage action, but it could also harm intrinsic motivation and pressure schools and districts to take shortcuts. Providing no incentives, on the other hand, may cultivate intrinsic motivation to improve, but it risks making the assessment irrelevant. Um, in terms of what, how, and when results should be made available for the general public, whether we publicize the national assessment results. This is also very dilemmatic. Publicizing the results can educate the public, can enable parents to make more informed decisions because they will know the quality of uh, the schools. And on the other hand, it increases pres pressure for schools and districts um, to improve, but also to take shortcuts, which may poison the well. So next year, because schools and districts 
feel a lot of pressure to improve their scores because it's made public, uh, they may very well take shortcuts which destroy the validity and integrity of the assessments. And hence, we will have a lot of data, but doesn't reflect the actual conditions of each schools. On the other hand, not publicizing the results may cultivate intrinsic motivation to improve, but can be perceived as lacking transparency and accountability. And again, it risks making the assessments irrelevant. So nobody will care about the assessments, basically. So these are the dilemmas that we are facing at the moment. Um, we hope to be able to find robust enough answers um, in, in the coming months or at least next year. So I look forward to, uh, to the discussion and to your feedback and input. Thank you very much, Ananta. Thank you very much, Nino, for sharing the dilemmas. Yeah? Hopefully we can discuss and find the best solutions. Uh, it's Mr. David De Cavalio. Uh, he's a CEO of Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority. Hello, Mr. David. Uh, and uh, as uh, I've called the presentation Room for Improvement, uh, because uh, when I was a school teacher and when I was a student, uh, they were words that um, were often written in reports uh, on the basis of assessment. Uh, and I think that there is room for improvement in Australia's national assessment program, and there may be things um, that could be uh, learnt, lessons learnt from what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, in our uh, situation that might be useful for other, other countries uh, and Indonesia. So I might go to the next slide if I could, uh, and I would just like to run through uh, some of the details of our national assessment program. I do hope that you can read that. I'm sorry if it's a little bit too crowded, but I'll go through it systematically. So we have a, 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 a test which we call NAPLAN. Now NAPLAN stands for the National Assessment Program in Literacy and Numeracy. It is a whole population test in literacy and numeracy skills for years three, five, seven and nine. And it's been running since 2008, when it was a paper test using mainly multiple choice um, uh, questions, which were then uh, run through machines for machine marking, with the exception of writing. So we actually have five tests. One of them is numeracy. Uh, then there is a reading test, a writing test, a spelling test, and a test in conventions of language or grammar and punctuation. From 2018 to 2022, we've been in the process of transitioning uh, the operation of those tests from being purely paper-based tests to fully online tests. We didn't have tests in 2020 because of COVID. So uh, m the benefit of moving online is that we can do adaptive testing, whereby uh, instead of getting all students getting exactly the same questions, um, all students start with getting the same questions. They might get the first six or seven questions the same. And then depending on how they answer them, uh, they will either get a harder set of questions or an easier set of questions for the next testlet or subtest. And then depending again on how they answer those, they could get easier or harder again. And so you get a much more accurate read um, for how the students are performing, about what they can do and what they can't do. Now, the original purpose of NAPLAN was to provide a snapshot in time of how the school and the system were going overall in terms of national standards, uh, in terms of uh, literacy and numeracy. NAPLAN is not a formative assessment at the individual student level, but it is useful for teachers and schools and parents to get an objective external refer reference point. Um, and it helps schools and systems in particular to evaluate the effectiveness of their teaching programs. Now, when it comes to the results being reported publicly, this is a key issue for uh, our previous speaker, but it's also one that 
we have taken a certain path in Australia, which has its pros and cons. So we report the results nationally in terms of um, student means against a 1,000 point scale. Um, and then we report the results uh, at the state and territory level. Um, as people may know, Australia is a federated country. We have uh, six states and two territories or eight provinces all together. And the results are reported at that level as well. But they are also reported publicly at the school level. We have a, a website called My School, where any member of the public can look up the results of any school in the country to see how they've gone in terms of their literacy and numeracy performance. Uh, and that phenomenon has been very controversial uh, and has probably contributed to some of the most heated debates around the benefits of whole of population testing in Australia. And perhaps we might get an opportunity to go into that in more detail during the discussion. Individual student results are reported to parents. Um, we would call this a moderate stakes test, but many people would call it a high stakes test in Australia. Uh, and it is, as I said, um, a source of ongoing controversy, uh, which has to be dealt with. Um, one of the sources of controversy is that when NAPLAN was first introduced in 2008, it was uh, touted as a, a key uh, mechanism for improving overall school performance and system performance. But what we have found over the last 12 years is that the changes in performance levels uh, against the test are very, very moderate. They're small over time, um, but they haven't resulted in large-scale improvement at the national or state and territory level, though there has been much better improvement uh, at the school level. Um, and so you often have uh, critics of NAPLAN uh, calling for an end to NAPLAN uh, because it hasn't actually led to any improved results, um, which is an interesting argument. Uh, it's uh, like saying, well, the thermometer needs to be, um, we need to do away with thermometers because uh, the, the temperature of the, of the, uh, the sick patient isn't getting uh, any better. Um, so, but these are the kinds of arguments that you hear uh, are associated with NAPLAN. An important development this year is that we're moving the test um, from term two, from May to term one in 2023. And the aim there is to get the results back earlier in the year to schools and systems and parents. Now, in addition to the whole of population testing and literacy and numeracy in years three, five, seven and nine, we also have a cycle, a three year cycle of sample assessments where we uh, choose a sample of students from across the country in year six and year 10. And we run sample assessments in science digital literacy and civics and citizenship. Uh, this year, we are running a digital literacy assessment. Next year, it will be science, and the year after, it will be civics and citizenship. Uh, the results are publicly really reported at the national, state and territory level, but not at the school level. Although the schools that participate in the sample do get their results back, but they are not publicly reported at the school level. They are uh, consequently, arguably, a low stakes test, certainly at school level. Um, these tests also include um, the ability for us to conduct student surveys on um, certain things. Um, their activity, for example, in relation to their civic engagement, um, their attitudes towards school. Um, and so that is actually quite rich, useful information which we can gather through these sample surveys that are attached to the sample assessments. Now, in addition, um, from 2024, we are going to make available to all schools and systems these tests as opt-in tests. So if you're not chosen as part of the sample, you can still choose to do the test and to get results back for your school uh, against that gives you um, uh, an idea of how you're travelling against the national standard. And it will be interesting to see what the take-up of that is. 
one of the things that uh, that we think might um, lead to good take up is that there's no public reporting of the results. It's just used for, for school improvement for those schools who choose to opt in. Uh, the other aspect of our national assessment program, uh, which I'm sure Andreas is delighted about, is that um, we are participants in PISA and uh, TIMS and PEARLS. PISA especially has a very high profile in our uh, country uh, and has contributed to a narrative about declining standards. Uh, and the history of Australia's um, results in PISA has not been a happy story, uh, where both in relative terms and in ob um, uh, objective terms, um, we have uh, seen a decline in the performance of our 15 year olds against uh, those PISA assessments. And that has um, driven a lot of discussion in Australia about what we need to do to lift uh, outcomes, not just in literacy and numeracy, but in those key aspects of uh, reading and um, mathematics and science, and particularly those uh, problem solving skills that PISA focuses on. So that's our national assessment program. Um, I might just go to the next slide. There are other assessments outside the national assessment program. As I mentioned before, Australia is a federation and most states and territories also have their own assessments within their own government school systems in particular. So for example, um, a number of states are now running a phonics check in year one uh, to identify children who'll need additional assistance in learning how to read, but those results are not uh, published, um, are made available. They are simply there to identify students who might need support and to, to identify schools that might need particular support as well if uh, they have a, a lot of students in, in the category uh, that requires support. New South Wales has science tests in year six, eight and 10. Western Australia and in New South Wales in year 10, they both have online literacy and numeracy assessments which are prerequisites uh, for being eligible for a senior secondary certi certificate. Um, uh, so if you don't pass the online literacy and numeracy assessment, you can't get your senior secondary certificate. Um, very controversial, um, but um, it does uh, mean that when students leave uh, WA New South Wales schools, employers and tertiary education institutions can be confident uh, that uh, they have a, a minimum national standard of, um, uh, of literacy and numeracy. Uh, and a number of jurisdictions also conduct wellbeing or attitude surveys. For example, New South Wales had a survey in year nine called Tell Them From Me. So there's a lot of assessment going on. In addition, a lot of uh, schools um, voluntarily use the ACER, Progressive Achievement Tests, PAC. Uh, and especially the large Catholic systems and the independent schools. Um, so people might be aware in Australia, we have three schooling sectors. 70% um, of our students are educated in the state and territory government school systems. About 20% uh, are educated in Catholic system schools and the other 10%, you know, pushing up to, you know, almost 15% in some states uh, are educated in independent schools which are not part of uh, systems. And a lot of these schools use uh, the PAP tests um, as, uh, as diagnostic uh, tools to uh, help guide um, teaching programs. And then uh, Andreas, of course, is also introducing and promoting uh, PISA for schools, which is being investigated by some school authorities in New South Wales, again, on an opt-in basis where um, schools could choose to undertake a PISA-like test and get their results back. So it's a very um, full and rich and complex assessment environment in Australia. Um, arguably, um, arguments, uh, part of the controversy is how much testing is too much testing. Um, and that's a, a key part of um, the considerations that other nations will no doubt be having. I might go on to the last slide and just run through quickly um, uh, some of the issues that we've uh, been dealing with and look forward to discussing in the in the conversation. So that what's done in Australia may not be right for other countries or even for Australia. So we're always thinking about how we need to improve the system uh, that, we, that we have now. Um, in Australia, 
It's really interesting. It's competition between schools, sectors and state and territories is, to a greater or lesser extent, seen as the driver of improvement. Uh, this notion that I've got a, um, uh, my reputation uh, is at stake. Uh, you know, I'm being compared um, to the school down the road or uh, the school, you know, similar schools. And so you have to be seen, there's a competition is a big driver. Now that um, is driven uh, by the public reporting of results, particularly at the school level. And it is, as I said before, one of the most controversial aspects about the, uh, the NAPLAN regime, uh, with many principals in particular concerned that it is um, leading to a breakdown in collaboration amongst principals, um, a kind of um, status anxiety amongst principals and turning that plan into a high stakes test. Um, and I think there is would be a widespread view amongst many people that some of those problems that were identified uh, in the last speaker's last slide have come to fruition in Australia uh, in terms of that balance between accountability on the one hand and intrinsic motivation on the other uh, and what's best and can we find a middle path. Uh, and that shortcut issue is captured in the phrase teaching to the test. Uh, in other words, are teachers and schools focusing so much on just getting good results on, on, on literacy and numeracy that they might be neglecting uh, the appropriate teaching of the broader curriculum. I'm not saying that's what is happening, I'm saying that is a, uh, a key part of the national narrative, the national conversation as to whether that is happening or not. So I guess the key point, and it was again the point emphasised by the last speaker, is that when you are making these decisions, the key thing is to be very clear about the purpose of the assessment. Is it primarily to uh, hold school authorities accountable for their performance? Is it primarily about school or system improvement? Is it primarily about individual student diagnostics? Uh, and it may be to some extent all of those things, but the lesson I think that we've learned is that the more things you try to do with one assessment, the more targets you try to hit with one tool, the more likely you are to fail to achieve any one of those purposes. Um, so the key question there is, what's the purpose of the assessment and what will you do with the data? Um, and how will you use it? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I'll give you some quote that's very, very interesting. Yeah. What is done in Australia may be not be right for your other countries or even for the Australia. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Slacker. Uh, he's a special officer on education policy to the Secretary General. OECD. Time is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think this connects really quite well to the previous uh, presentations. We look at assessment actually as a very powerful tool to support the Gotong Royal. Uh, sometimes assessment is not so good in telling you what But I do think it's a very powerful tool to give you a sense of what other people are doing and to what extent and what you can learn from those experiences. I think now it's now starting to work. Um, <coughs> next slide. Uh, but uh, Next slide, please. But there are always difficult choices that you need to make. Uh, we often err in putting a lot of effort into measured, measuring outcomes and too little to collect information that help us understand those outcomes. And uh, in fact, in the work on PISA, we have invested very considerably to develop good covariates that help us understand and then feed back into what helps teachers teach better and schools to become more effective. Second trade-off is as difficult. You want to have a very large sample so that you have a lot of granularity in your results and at the same time that often you know, drives you towards efficiency gains rather than validity gains. So again, a difficult choice. How much weight do you put on the the validity of the measurement, measure what you treasure, or you know, at the size of your system so that you can actually measure lots of uh, 
data points. Uh, a third really difficult question is, <coughs> and it's again a trade-off, to what extent are you looking to find answers to questions that you knew beforehand? No, many people tell you we, you have to know your research questions before you design your assessment. But that can also be a trap by not allow you to look enough in areas that are at the periphery at your vision, where sometimes the most interesting innovation really happens, so striking that kind of balance. And um, the toughest challenge for us has always been that some people say, if you want to measure change and progress, you can never change the measure. And if you actually adhere to that, you will end up assessing your students on things that are no longer relevant. And uh, next slide, please. What I wanted to <coughs> show you today is actually a little bit of our new thinking about assessment, the kind of new m metrics that we are putting in place to ensure that we measure actually what remains relevant. Now, if you click, uh, one thing that we do see is that the kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test are precisely the kind of things that are also easy to digitize, to automate these days. Now. Routine cognitive skills are diminishing in importance in our labor markets, and they are the ones that you can capture best with the multiple choice tests. Now, technology intensive task are, uh, tasks are on the rise, and click. If you put the two things together, you can see the future of work. If you please click. Um, that's what we know, you know. And that really puts a lot of what we do in assessment to a really tough test. Now, are we measuring the non-routine cognitive skills plus the social emotional skills? Click. In the last PISA assessment, uh, we captured something that we call the student's growth mindset. You see that here on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, you can see the success of countries on the PISA test. And you can actually see there's as much variability of growth mindset as you find on academic performance. And as you can also see, education systems that are doing well academically also tend to do quite well on student growth mindset. Now, on the right side, you can see countries where students believe, you know, if I try hard, my teacher's gonna help me and I'm gonna be successful. On the left side, you see countries where students mainly believe, well, you know, success is about the intelligence I was born with and therefore why should I study hard? And you can see the two tend to be actually quite well related at the system level as much as at the individual level. They tend to be much closer related than many traditional factors that we try to sort of capture, like money. Spending per student is not a great predictor for system performance, nor is curriculum time. They correlate somewhat, but actually when you get, once you get into those questions of mindset, you can see really strong associations. If you go to the next slide, click. You can also see students with a growth mindset were more motivated to master difficult tasks. They had a greater sense of self-efficacy. They were less afraid of failure. No? And think about it. If you want your students to be creative, you have to give them space to experiment. If they experiment, they need to take risks. If they take risks, they make mistakes. If your education system is not very good in supporting students, learn from and with mistakes, maybe they won't be so creative. And you can suddenly see those things all interrelate. No? And that has, click, that has led us actually to um, study this in much greater detail more recently. No? We looked at you know, issues around task performance. No? Yeah, you can just click through that. Task performance, we looked at if issues of emotional regulation. No? We looked at issues of social skills, collaboration. We looked at open-mindedness. No? curiosity, tolerance. We looked at um, <clears throat> uh, engagement with other people and at the end of the day also in the kind of uh, <clears throat> related outcomes. Now, measuring those things is never easy. You have to resort to sometimes very different types of instruments. Now, sometimes you need to go into observations. Sometimes you can go into self-reports. For some, we have actually found quite good ways of direct assessment, but that's basically been something that we have most recently added to get some picture of the social emotional outcomes. Next slide, please. Here you can see a list of countries that or cities that have taken part initially in the first developmental work. Click once more. 
and once more. <coughs> And here you can see sort of first results. Often we look at you know, academic outcomes and social emotional outcomes as opposing ends of a spectrum. But they're actually more like two sides of the same coin. You can see, for example, here very well that students who uh, were great, more persistent in their work also had better outcomes in mathematics no? or who had greater trust. Curiosity in mathematics are very closely related. No? Not a surprise to someone you know who knows mathematics. Mathematics is very much about uh, curiosity, not so much about creativity, but you can suddenly see social emotional outcomes and academic outcomes actually relate quite well. Now, when you look at the arts, picture is slightly different, outcomes were less predictive, but you could see similar patterns. So don't think of you know, academic success and social emotional outcomes as you know you have to make a choice between them, you know, look at them as two sides of the same coin and how you can develop them in a similar instructional setting. Next slide, please. Gender differences. You know, education generally has done a quite good job in eliminating gender differences in academic performance. On our PISA assessment for most countries, we no longer see big gender gaps. A little bit in mathematics, maybe more in reading, but more or less, that is not so much a story, but when you look to social emotional outcomes, please click. You can see the story is actually quite different. No? You can see, for example, here, let me just get that on my screen as well. You can see that uh, girls tend to have a greater sense of responsibility, more achievement motivation, they also show greater levels of empathy, more cooperation, more tolerance. But you can't say that girls are doing better on social emotional skills because boys have their strengths too. They may be more stress resistant. They showed greater optimism. They could handle their emotions better. They were more assertive. They showed higher levels of energy. And this is about 10 year olds. And then you can see also the data for 15 year olds where the gender gap is growing. Well, those gender differences are much larger than what we see on cognitive outcomes, but we rarely look at them because we do not make them visible in traditional assessments. So as a teacher, you see the differences in math and science and reading. You're not necessarily seeing those kinds of outcomes. No. So making those non-cognitive social-emotional outcomes visible really serves a very, very important function in helping us understand different patterns. No how you can you know, act on that, but the fact that also the gender gap grows quite significantly as students become older is very important. If you click, and once more, this is one of the most disturbing charts. You know, we looked at this at the age of 10 and the age of 15, and we found that in every jurisdiction, 15-year-olds reported lower levels of creativity than 10-year-olds. If I would tell you here, you know, your students do worse in mathematics at age 15 than they did at age 10, you would tell me, oh, well, there must be something terribly wrong going on at schooling. Once again, it's a question that we rarely ask ourselves when it comes to outcomes like creativity. Developmental psychologists have explanations for this. You know, as you become older, you know, you become more self-critical, you know, maybe self, more self-conscious, and so on and so on. There may be some aspects of this, but as you can see here, the picture was very much confirmed when we asked the parents and then we asked the teachers. There's something going on here. We're all born with an abundance of creativity. You know, if you have a three-year-old son or daughter, they're going to question everything that you tell them. They're going to experiment with anything that gets into their way. They're always willing to learn, always willing to unlearn, always willing to relearn. But then, you know, we put children into school. We try to make them compliant with, you know, established ways of thinking. We make them reproduce the established wisdom of our times rather than question it. And then we are surprised that actually, you know, some of that most important energy in the 21st century is getting lost. Once again, you know, we should be seeing this. How to deal with this, how to tackle this is a very difficult question, but the starting point should be that at a matter of course, assessment evaluation should be telling us those kinds of stories. And actually, if you click once more, you can see actually students who participate in arts activities, you know, greater reported generally more creativity and greater curiosity. To some extent, that also worked with sports. Once again, 
we should start to look at maybe the arts not as an extracurricular activity, but something that you know has a very specific function within the curriculum. Now, once again, we cannot change what we cannot see, and therefore making those outcomes visible really serves a very important function. So why did the arts disappear from so many school curricula over the last 20 years? You know, that's something that we observe at the OECD. Now there's less and less space that's going into those subjects. And you can see the answer on the next slide. If you click once more, yeah. On the horizontal axis, you can see, you know, what you earn with a specific field of study. And on the vertical axis, how many students go into those studies. And you can see, you know, engineering, is a great choice, you earn a great salary with this. And if you become an artist on the left side, or even education, it's not such a great choice. No? You don't earn a great salary with this. No? So that is part of the explanation why we ended up where we are ending up. No? Parents know those kinds of data, and they will give their children corresponding advices. But that's very much a 20th century way of thinking about it. If you click once more, in the 21st century, when we ask, you know, you take the 100 most innovative jobs in OECD economies, how did people get there? Well, you know, number one is about computing, because most of the innovation today is about technological innovation, no surprise. And number two, people have gone through the arts. Once again, we need to see those outcomes to make them tangible, visible. Next slide, please. Last point I want to really make is about uh, students' well-being. If you look at the well-being of 10-year-olds, uh, 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 next slide, you can see the picture looks quite positive. No? Most 10-year-olds, this is the kind of index that we use from the WHO, report quite positive well-being outcomes. No? When you look at the same questions at age 15, click, you can see that the bars get much shorter now. Once again, there are developmental factors involved. And students get older, they go through a difficult phase. But as an educator, shouldn't I know about this? No. To develop an you know, effective strategy to contain that, to address that? No. And look at the gender gap. At age 10, you know, boys and girls report similarly positive well-being outcomes. At age 15, you know, there's a huge gap between boys and girls. Once again, shouldn't we know? Next slide. <clears throat> So we ask ourselves, you know, what predicts well-being? And actually, you know, when you, yeah, you are already there. Uh, basically, at the left side, you can see the 10-year-olds. Um, you can see high expectations from parents are a great predictor for student well-being. Actually, high expectations from teachers are also a really good predictor for student well-being for young children. Competition at school also, you know, positively related to student well-being. But, as you can see, there's also a red bar. All of those factors tend to drive up test anxiety. So there you can see, yeah, there are sort of positive sides and negative sides coming out of this. No? But once again, we should be knowing this. You can do that at the system level. This is the next slide. And uh, you can see on the vertical axis, again, the index of well-being. And on the horizontal axis, you can see the <coughs> test anxiety. And uh, look at this. You see, superficially, you might say, ah, you, you see, I told you, tests are really something that makes students nervous and very anxious. These are, these are the data for girls. But actually, if you compare the city of Daegu in Korea with the city of Helsinki in Finland, you see there's a very puzzling picture. In Daegu, they actually do lots and lots and lots of testing. And students feel quite relaxed about it. No? And they actually report a very high level of well-being and actually low levels of t test anxiety. In the city of Helsinki, they never do assessment at the age of 10. And you can still see, you know, students actually feel quite worried about the assessment. And they actually don't report that high level of well-being. And you can see actually the same picture for boys. Boys are overall more relaxed, but the same kind of pattern. But what you can see here very clearly is that you can't take an easy explanation that tests are the cause of lowered student well-being and greater anxiety. There are other factors going on. You can see that on the next slide, actually, when you look at this, where, when we ask you know, ourselves what were the most important, the three most important predictors of student well-being, 
Well, the first is about the sense of optimism, not surprisingly, students, you know, that approach life with a sense of optimism, they showed a high level of uh, psychological well-being, stress resistance as well, you know, and that's the Korean secret, you know, those kids got used to tests, they do that every day, and therefore they're quite relaxed about it, and actually quite uh, uh, resistant and resilient to this, and then a tens of energy. Those were the best student uh, level predictors. And that brings me to my final slide. <clears throat> when you might ask ourselves, you know, okay, what predicts those three ingredients? Stress resistance, optimism, energy. Are those things that, you know, we can change through public policy or instructional practice, or are these, you know, personality traits of students? And as you can see here very clearly is that is the quality of the student-teacher relationship that actually was that most powerful predictor of you know, stress resistance, optimism, emotional control. And when you actually, as you can see, actually on most of the other dimensions that we uh, chose to measure as well, you know, students who could see their teachers as you know, being interested in them, you know, my teacher tries to understand who I am and who I want to become, and they accompany me on my journey, you could see students feeling a greater sense of responsibility, more persistent, more self-controlled. You know? more stress resistant, more optimistic, better in control of their emotions, right? greater sense of empathy, greater sense of trust, cooperation, tolerance, curiosity, creativity. Right? We couldn't find you know, any system level predictors that were as strong as the kind of social capital that is in the school. And that really shows us that education is never a transactional business. It's always a social and relational enterprise. But we will only, you know, can only act on this when we have actually metrics that make those kinds of outcomes visible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Powerful. Mr. Colin Wetson, he's a uh, research Australian Council for CR UK. Hello, Mr. Colin. Yeah, it's time, sisters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just sharing my screen, so hopefully you can see the presentation as well. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, the uh, national assessment in England. Um, prior to joining ACER in the UK, I worked at the Standards and Testing Agency, uh, which is the organisation responsible for national assessments in England. Um, I'm talking England only, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland um, have different systems for large-scale national assessment. So, in England, large-scale national assessment has been in uh, place since the 1990s, um, but there have been significant changes since 2010 uh, with the change of government. Um, and one of the things that's happened in that period is there's been much more clarity on the purposes of the assessments, though you may notice that I do say purposes still, uh, we haven't managed to get it to one purpose per assessment. There are still multiple, but there's much more clarity on which is the main purpose for each of the assessments. And as you can see on the next slide, there are a number of assessments that take place throughout schooling in primary school in England, um, but these assessments have different purposes and therefore uh, data is available in different ways for each of these assessments. So if we start with the ones for the youngest children, reception baseline assessment, this is a new assessment um, and its purpose is about holding, uh, enabling us to hold schools to account for the progress of their pupils through primary school. So the accountability system is quite strong in England um, and uh, needed a starting point to measure where children are when they begin school in order to then see progress to the end of primary school. But one of the main concerns about this assessment was that it might limit expectation or um, label children inappropriately. It's taken in the first six weeks of a child starting school. Um, and uh, so for this assessment, the data actually isn't provided back to the school. It is only kept centrally to be used to create that progress measure when the child reaches the end of primary school. Um, so it's a, um, an unusual assessment in the sense that the data is not provided back to the school, 
though the tasks are carried out one-to-one -one with a teacher, so they do um, obviously see what the child has done. They don't, don't get a score of um, overall uh, to report. Um, but the, uh, the um, schooling in England is divided into key stages. Um, the first stage ends um, at the end of reception year, that first year in school, um, and this, the early years foundation stage. So in order to give information to parents, in addition to the reception baseline assessment that takes place where those results are not made available, there is the early years foundation stage profile. That is an assessment that is um, made by teachers. They make judgments against 17 early learning goals. Um, but the purpose here of this assessment is to report that information to the child's parents and to have discussions about um, uh, their next stages of learning. Uh, the data is collected centrally and national results are published, but school level results are not made available for this because its primary purpose is to inform um, uh, parents uh, of the outcomes of, that their pupils are achieving. The next assessment um, in year one is the phonics screening check. And again, the purpose of this assessment is much more focused on the pupil. Um, it's to determine if the pupils are able to decode using phonics to an age appropriate standard. Um, it was introduced to make sure that schools were teaching phonics first, um, uh, fast in their um, teaching of children to read. Um, and again, individual results are reported to parents and the national and regional performance is published, but no school level performance. And once again, the primary purpose here is to identify those children who are not um, uh, able to decode using phonics to an appropriate standard so that interventions can be put in place to help them catch up with their reading. Um, there are currently end of key stage one assessments, so that's the next stage of learning. Um, these are assessments in reading, writing, mathematics and science. Some of those informed by tests, but they are generally teacher judgments that are made at the end of year two. Um, it has been announced by Minister that these assessments are to be um, withdrawn. They're currently used to be the starting point for measuring progress. But as I said, the reception baseline has been introduced to be that new start for measuring progress. And so to reduce the overall assessment burden, uh, ministers have announced that these assessments will be withdrawn. Uh, the tests will still be made available optionally to, um, uh, to schools to use if they wish, but there'll be no requirement for them to do so. And this is part of the discussion that has been going on for many years in England about whether there is too much national assessment that takes place. Um, and so with the introduction of a new reception baseline, uh, end of key stage one assessment was will be removed at the end of this year. Another new assessment that has been brought in, again with a focus very much on the pupil, is the multiplication tables check, a digital assessment um, of the um, uh, multiplication tables up to 12 by 12. It's taken at the end of year four. Um, and once again, the purpose here is to identify those children who have not learnt their multiplication tables and enable them to catch up um, and put in interventions to help them. Results reported to parents and national and regional res results um, are published, but no school level results again um, are made public. Uh, they are available to our inspection system, to Ofsted, who inspect schools, but uh, data is used as part of the conversation there, not the driver of the conversation. And as I say, no publicly available outcomes. The place where that changes is at the end of key stage two. So that's the end of primary school here. Um, we have tests again to determine the attainment of pupils at the end of the key stage. There are nationally set tests in mathematics, in English reading, and in English grammar, punctuation, and spelling. Teachers also do assessments in English writing and in science um, against nationally set frameworks. And these results are reported to parents and school national and regional performance are published. So it is this key stage two outcomes uh, where we have um, uh, performance tables published. So you can get school level results in these things. 
Um, the accountability system obviously is driven a lot by the um, data that comes from the key stage two test with progress measures um, from uh, early early years, whether that's the new reception baseline or prior to that key stage one. Um, assessments at, uh, in England have been controversial and as I say, there are many concerns about whether, or there have been concerns about whether there is too much testing, um, what the purpose of that testing is and how the results might be um, influencing beh school behaviour. Um, and so ministers have tried to focus down on the things that are important, um, but I think the, still, the same um, discussions that David talked about going on in Australia also go on in England um, about whether the system is uh, yet in the right place, uh, whether more changes are required. Um, if you want more information on any of those assessments and how they work, then um, I have put some links on the slides, assuming those will be shared at some point. Um, but given that we are coming out of time, I shall leave it there to so leave a bit of time for questions. Thank you. Now we are on session of uh, question and answer. Uh, from the front, first, the ladies. Okay, two. Third one on the corner, okay. The lady. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for four speakers for the very enlightened speech. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Destina Wahyu Winarti. I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Education, Universitas Islam International Indonesia. Uh, my question might be uh, specific to Pak Anin Dito from the Ministry of Education Indonesia, but I'm happy to get a response from other speakers if it is applicable for the context of Australia, uh, England, or even OECD. Uh, I'm interested to the assessment process that conducted by the Ministry of Education in the case of um, teacher and principal behavior. Uh, as maybe we are aware that uh, doing critical reflection for our teachers might be, um, I'm not saying that everyone, all the teachers can't do that, but there are some cases that teachers are not being able to criticize themselves doing the reflection. Uh, maybe when we ask, are you doing a good teaching? They're going to say yes, and do you have any problems? I don't have any problems, because they don't really know what is the problems there. So uh, maybe the question is how we can be assured that the assessment for the teacher's behavior is valid. And then the second one is about the relationship between teachers and principal is always interesting. Uh, the principal itself normally, um, they're going to assess the school or the teachers themselves more into the administration management, what happened uh, so far. Uh, less likely they're going to do more specific into the content of pedagogy. And so here my question is how, again, the assessment happened for the principal behavior. That's, that's the first question. Second, uh, if we have conducted that uh, assessment for teachers and principal, what is the next step that the government going to do to uh, mitigate what's going on? What we, what the government going to offer to support our teachers and principal and making the relationship of both of them are well so the school can run well as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Second one, Mr. Idum. Idum. Good afternoon. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aldi, and uh, I'm a student of uh, ITB, Institute of Technology Bandung, and also I'm a teacher in an international school in Bandung. Uh, my, actually, my question the same like uh, the lady before. Uh, how uh, the school can sure that the national assessment is uh, credible? Like, because uh, the problem is uh, the fact that uh, most of the students think that uh, this assessment it will not affect to their score. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Professor John before said that uh, the assessment is important for the student uh, uh, is important for the student, uh, but the student need to understand what is the next step 
what is the next level level they they need to achieve but for the national assessment uh, there is no feedback for the student itself but the feedback only for the uh, the schools for general and also for uh, because i'm teaching in international school uh, as a, uh, our school also joined for the national assessment but the problem is uh, it is not all the students understand in bahasa indonesia even they understand about bahasa indonesia there are some terminal terminology that they don't under, understand so uh, come back to the question so how the school the school can uh, sure that the result or the feedback for uh, from national assessment is uh, credible thank you so about the validity of the feedback right okay uh, the last one in the corner the lady Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Chokorda from the Admika School. So <clears throat> just, just yesterday, I talked with one of the schools who are going to the school's transformations program. Uh, Pak Nino just mentioned about the level of the schools, one, two, three. So this school is saying a question like this. Um, my school is accredited A-level, but on the level, I got only one. So the question is, I'm just wondering, with the massive data that you have been compiled with that one, this is also happening in Australia, you got school accreditation. In UK, you got Ofsted also that do the school accreditations. What will be the link? Or is it still relevant to do the accreditations with all the massive data you've got? For the OECD, Mr. Andreas, do you have any study um, when you when you got the data of the school performance in comparisons with their accreditations, is that match um, positively or how's the result? That's only it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the first and second question, I think uh, Panino will explain, right? Thank you. Okay, terima kasih. Thank you, Bu Destina, and I didn't catch the name of the second. Aldi, Pak Aldi, and Pak Chokorda. Uh, the first and second questions are about the validity of the national assessment. Um, something that we are very um, concerned about as well, uh, obviously, for, for obvious reasons. Um, Budestina mentioned the um, many teachers have difficulty in critically reflecting about the quality of their practice, uh, which is true and it is reflected in the national assessment data as well. So if we compare data from students and teachers, we see a large dis discrepancy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I remember correctly, for example, on the growth mindset questions. Um, most teachers, when we ask the teachers whether they believe that their students have a um, that their students uh, can grow in ability, that their students' ability can develop, uh, whether the teachers have growth mindsets about their students, most teachers say yes. So there's an awareness that having a growth mindset about their students is important. But when we ask the same set of questions to their students, then I think fewer than 3% of students in Indonesia um, feel that their teachers believe that they have um, you know, the ability to grow. Um, so few t students in Indonesia feel that their teachers possess a growth mindset about them. So, and this discrepancy can be observed in most, if not all, of the aspects of teaching quality that we measure in the national assessment. Uh, that's one observation. Uh, the second observation is that if we separate data from students and teachers with regards to teaching quality, we see that it is data from students that are predictive of learning outcomes. Data from teachers is predictive, but only much weaker uh, compared to the student uh, data. 
data. So yes, these observations indicate that um, critical reflection among teachers is a challenge. I don't think it's unique in Indonesia. It's um, um, this pattern of uh, results um, we can find in many, many, many other countries. Now, what's the consequence on the validity of the data? Um, the national assessment uh, instruments went through a rigorous set of trial and validation uh, before we used it at the national level. So uh, we have evidence that all of the instruments are um, you know, coherent, they're internally consistent, uh, they have good factorial structure and so on. The, a lot of them um, you know, present good um, theoretically coherent relationships with other variables as well. Um, but having said that, this is precisely why we collect data not only from the teachers themselves, but we combine data from students and principals. So for example, if we evaluate um, uh, the indicator for teaching quality comes from not only from teachers evaluating themselves, but from students evaluating their teachers and principals evaluating the teachers. So we combine self-evaluation with evaluation from uh, students and principals or other people. Um, pa Hadi, the second uh, question was about uh, the validity of the student data, I believe, because students, um, there's no implication for students in um, uh, in the national assessment. That's the same in all international assessments, by the way, and all um, uh, assessments that are low stakes. So students simply um, participate in the assessments without uh, getting the results back and with no consequence uh, whatsoever to them. So how does this impact the assessment results? Well, obviously it reflects student performance uh, in that situation. It reflects student performance when there is no stakes to perform, which is you know, the typical situation we find ourselves in, right? So it doesn't mean that it's not valid. It just means that um, that reflects performance, not at situations that are high stakes, but uh, at low stakes uh, situations. Uh, with regards to Bahasa Indonesia, yes, we have um, received some complaints from international schools. Um, many students in international schools um, are not that proficient in Bahasa Indonesia. That's why probably one of the main reasons that they go to international schools. Um, and uh, by the way, my daughter is uh, among these students. Uh, she's not in international school, but uh, she speaks um, uh, English and Germany more fluently than Indonesian. So when she got selected in the assessment nation, <laughs> this was quite stressful for her, and uh, she couldn't understand many of the questions even, right? Um, but So we have to acknowledge that as a confounding variable. Basically, the results for schools that cater for students who are not proficient in Bahasa Indonesia is very much confounded by their uh, linguistic ability. So it doesn't really reflect their literacy and numeracy um, levels. Uh, but we chose not to uh, cater for testing in English because what we, uh, the ability to read and understand Bahasa Indonesia is part of what we want to measure. So it doesn't really make sense then to convert the test into English, right? Um, if schools would like to get a better um, a picture of their students' literacy and numeracy levels, then we provide the tools, assessment tools, in Platform Merdeka Mengajar for teachers to use to s assess their students. Those formatist tests are built based on the same theoretical framework, the same assessment framework as the national assessment. So uh, for these schools where national assessment doesn't really reflect the ability of, 
of the students, um, confounded by Bahasa Indonesia ability, for example, then we really encourage teachers and schools to use uh, the, uh, the same instruments, you know, parallel instruments, uh, to assess uh, their students and maybe you can adapt them into English first uh, to, to be able to get a, a more comprehensive picture of uh, your students' abilities. Pak Chandra on accreditation. So the first national assessment in 2021 uh, serves only as a baseline. Uh, in the future, we will use the subsequent results in the national assessment as the basis to re, um, re for re-accreditation. So for schools that already have an accreditation status, the re-accreditation of those schools will depend on the trend in performance from year to year in the national assessment. Right, so if there's a discrepancy between accreditation um, status at the moment with the national assessment, that is actually not uh, very surprising because the, accreditation, accre the current accreditation uh, evaluation, uh, uh, student learning outcomes only contributes minimally, if uh, at all, to the accreditation status of the school. Whereas the national assessment um, is mainly based on teaching and learning quality. So they use very different criteria. That's why we see um, a lot of discrepancies between accreditation status and uh, the national assessment results. But uh, again, in the future, these will be aligned because re-accreditation will be based on uh, school performance from year to year in the national assessment. And uh, that also answers um, the first speaker's, uh, the first question um, on how we plan to use the, the assessment. We haven't worked out all the ways that we want to use the national assessment, by the way. That's um, what I presented in my last slide. There's still a lot of dilemmas. Uh, we are still trying to resolve a lot of questions before uh, determining policies on how to use the national assessment. One way that we have used the national assessment is to give it back to teachers, principals, and districts as a way to self-evaluate, so to prompt teachers, principals, and districts to reflect on the quality of their teaching and learning, and then to plan their budget accordingly. So this is what we are doing at the national level uh, this year and next year. We really want districts to be able to, well, to want to open their education scorecards, first of all, and then to understand um, where they are um, in, in terms of teaching and learning quality, and then to use that as a reflection and um, to diagnose what they need to prioritize and how they can use their budget most effectively to improve the quality of their teaching and learning within the school and the, and the districts. So that's one way we are already using the national assessment. But uh, as I mentioned, there are many other ways that we can and plan to use the national assessment. We just haven't you know, decided on a specific policy on how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Valero. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Just on the question of the stakes it, and the relationship to validity, it really depends what you are interested in. If you want to know what a student can do under, you know, high pressure conditions, you know, then attach a lot of consequences to this and you will find out. But I would argue that in most situations, that's not the most relevant answer. You know, if you're an employer, you're not interested what somebody could possibly do under extreme conditions. You want to know, actually, what are they going to deliver on a normal, typical work situation? And uh, I would actually argue the lower you can make the states, the more realistic is the assessment. Yes, yeah, some students may not be putting a lot of effort into this, but so maybe in, 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 in real life. So I would actually argue that the low stakes assessment situation gets you the more uh, valid answer, even though not the best possible answer the student can give you. And I, I would actually go one step further. I would actually say many of the problems in education that we face today are a result of divorcing learning from assessment. No? We ask students to pile up years and years and years of learning, and then one day we say to them, oh, well, come back, tell me everything that you know in a very constrained, contrived kind of artificial situation. And that then ripples down the whole learning process. No? And, um, I, I believe the future of assessment will 
fully integrate learning and assessment. Now, while you study, the computer will give you, you know, good ideas on, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses are. And I, I think we will move towards that kind of situation. And by the way, that was also the past of assessment. If you go long enough back in history, you know, all learning was through apprenticeship. You know, we always learn from and with people and we get that immediate feedback and appraisal and learn by doing things. That was the normal way of learning. And then <coughs> the industrial mode of schooling brought in that separation between learning and assessment. But I think it's actually more the exception than, than the rule. I, I, I firmly believe that in the, in the long run, will become much better to integrating learning and assessment on a fairly continual basis using uh, digital tools. And, and, and sometimes today, the most interesting data you get out of international assessments is not whether students get the answer right or wrong, but actually how they got to their answers. And we are starting to get actually some really interesting patterns out of this. Uh, second part is on the accreditation question. Actually, you know, accreditation often is a measure that goes quite back in uh, some, some years back and when you look at current assessment results and uh, earlier accreditation decisions they do not align very well in many cases that just highlights how important it is to get you know accurate real-time data on on school performance we have the same experience for school grades you know we look at student marks that uh, uh, students get and uh, we look at assessment results and you can see big disconnects at the individual level at the school level and sometimes at the system level you know the uh, you take a country like uh, like italy and europe and the gap between the north and the south in the in the same country uh, on a pisa scale is about two grade years no? for the same school mark so it's two school years for the same school mark. So actually, I think accreditation decisions need to be validated. And that's why I find you know, the, the answer from Pak Anidito really very relevant. We need to find ways to actually you know, continuously review those kinds of, of, of decisions. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, actually, time is up, but uh, I'm going to open one question. Is there any? from the floor? No, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we yeah. uh, thank you very much for the speaker of this afternoon, uh, Nino, uh, Mr. Andreas, Mr. David, and uh, Mr. Colin. Uh, thank you very much also uh, for the uh, participant who coming off this uh, symposia. Uh, please applause for the four speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.